Hi, welcome back to Protein Function in Biochemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you. Um, in this video, we're specifically going to talk about the Haldane effect, and we're going to compare it to the Bohr effect because these are two topics that are very often confused with each other. And I think you'll find um, they're really, they're, they're similar in some ways, but there is enough of a difference to where hopefully we can learn it. And we'll also go in a little more detail on the Haldane effect. The Haldane effect is arguably a little bit simpler than the Bohr effect, so um, that's actually a good thing. So for the Bohr effect, that's what we talked about in the previous two videos. And this was the equation, this one in blue. This is the one describing the Bohr effect, right? And we talked about how this was really a very good exercise in Le Chatelier's principle. So the Bohr effect says, how does pH affect oxygen binding? The general statement is that if I have a low pH, which corresponds to high hydrogen ion concentration, I get release of oxygen. That's the tendency for hemoglobin. Conversely, I could also say high pH or low H plus favors binding of oxygen. I could say either one of those things. If I look at this according to the chemical equation, um, and we talked about how to read this a little more in the previous videos, so if you need help on that, go back and watch that, but I'll just kind of glance over this. If I have a lot of hydrogen ions, so this is going to correspond to a lower pH value, okay, the high hydrogen ions have a tendency by Le Chatelier's principle to shift this whole reaction to the right because that's the basis of Le Chatelier's principle. If I'm loading up the system with, or the equation with one reactant, it's going to shift the reaction towards the right to relieve the stress. So notice if I have a lot of hydrogen ions, it shifts it to the right, and hopefully you can see that it's going to cause oxygen dissociation, right? In this state, in the reactant side, I have hemoglobin bound to oxygen, but if I'm loading up with lots of H+, it shifts over here, and you can hopefully see that the oxygen is dissociated. And that's what we say. Low pH means high hydrogen ion concentration and release of oxygen. And that's the Bohr shift, and that's described ultimately by the Bohr effect. And the question really is, is how does pH, or H+, how does pH affect oxygen binding versus release? The second equation here is the Haldane equation, or Haldane effect. This says something similar, but ultimately different. Now, in the previous video, what I did mention is that when we looked at that um, carbonic acid bicarbonate buffering system equation, what it said is that if I have a high concentration of hydrogen ions by another exercise in Le Chatelier's principle, this is going to correspond to a high concentration of carbon dioxide. So anywhere in the blood, when I have a, lo a localized um, high concentration of H+, there is a tendency to also be high carbon dioxide. Okay, That's the tendency also because um, usually areas that are metabolically active are producing high acidity. And then metabolically active cells also release a lot of carbon dioxide as a waste product. So these two tend to go hand in hand for a number of reasons. The Haldane effect is different though than the Bohr effect because it's not asking how does pH affect oxygen binding, it's saying how does the concentration of CO2 affect oxygen binding. But there's another way to look at it too. It's not just saying that high CO2 causes release of oxygen, it also says that high oxygen causes a release of CO2, right? When we were looking at pH, okay, the actual buffer itself was really controlling the pH. But what this equation is saying is that if I have high CO2, CO2 can bind to hemoglobin, but that causes the release of oxygen. So the carbon dioxide itself intrinsically can cause release of oxygen. The CO2 can intrinsically cause the release of oxygen. The difference between that and the Bohr effect is also the oxygen itself O2 binding can intrinsically cause the release of carbon dioxide, okay? So essentially why this is different is, yes, we know from the Bohr effect that hydrogen ions intrinsically cause release of oxygen, but oxygen does not intrinsically cause the release of the proton, right? We can't just bind oxygen and protons will leave because the proton binding is dependent on the pH. That's a property of the solution, 
not of hemoglobin, okay? Because the solution, which is the blood, has a pH. So oxygen cannot cause hydrogen ions to just leave. It's the pH that causes the equilibrium to shift. The Haldane effect is different. It says that CO2 causes oxygen to be released, but also if oxygen binds, it causes CO2 to be released because those are two molecules themselves and they can sort of ping pong back and forth. CO2 can bind, kicks off oxygen, and then oxygen can also bind and it kicks off CO2. So, and that is ultimately described by this equation, the Haldane equation. Here I have carbon dioxide. That can ultimately bind to hemoglobin and kick off oxygen, right? I mean, this is by no means a mechanistic way of looking at it, but you can sort of hopefully see that. CO2 can bind to hemoglobin and kick off oxygen. And if I want to go the other way on this, I can do that. Oxygen can bind to hemoglobin and that'll kick off carbon dioxide. And you can go back to this. And this is an equilibrium, okay? If I'm looking at the molecular way that this actually works, um, we actually looked at it briefly in the previous video, but we're looking at it more specifically now. In general, there are two main amino acids that can bind to the carbon dioxide. And those are lysine residues, which are shown here. And then to a minor extent, arginine residues can also bind the carbon dioxide. And remember, this is one way carbon dioxide is carried in the blood, bound to hemoglobin. So I won't go into heavy duty me mechanisms here because it's really not that important, but there is a chance you will run into a lysine because it's in equilibrium with the protonated state. We run into it with this lone pair. Lone pair can do nucleophilic attack on the carbon dioxide carbon, proton rearrangement, and then notice you get this functional group right here, which we called in the last group, this was called a carbamino. It is important to realize, though, that carbon dioxide is not bound to hemoglobin in the form carbon dioxide. The actual uh, form it's in has been mutated a little bit. This is the actual CO2 right there, but you can see it's not CO2. It's actually tied up to this nitrogen, and it has an extra proton on it. That's the carbamino group. The other thing that can happen is you can actually have arginine residues that do the same thing. So here's a lone pair on this arginine R group. You'll do basically the same mechanistic approach. It'll attack this carbon. You'll get a proton rearrangement. And then also notice the same thing occurs. I get this carbamino group on the arginine R group. And if I'm also looking for the precise location of where the CO2 is, this is it right there. Okay, again, not in the form of carbon dioxide, but the atoms are still there, just mutated a little bit differently. Okay. If it was asked you which one of these occurs more, it's the lysine that occurs more. Why is that? Well, why wouldn't arginine do this as much? Let's say that lysine and arginine were present in equal amounts. Why would lysine do this more? Well, you have to look a little bit at more of an organic approach for this, but it's still doable. Lysine has a lone pair here. It's localized. Okay, localized lone pair means it can easily perform a reaction. And keep in mind that this binding of CO2, it's non-enzymatic. It just happens by chance whenever CO2 runs into it. It's not enzymatic. So this lysine has a localized lone pair that can do this reaction relatively easily. This lone pair on arginine is resonance stabilized, which means that it is ultimately delocalized. So this lone pair could actually be delocalized around this entire guanidinium group of arginine. So that makes it a lot less reactive, okay, ultimately. And so this second reaction with arginine doesn't happen to, to, to a very large extent compared to lysine, but it will happen to some extent, okay. And overall, this is called the Haldane effect, okay. This is where CO2 can bind to residues on hemoglobin, in the form of these carbamino groups, okay? And ultimately what we said is the carbon dioxide can cause the release of oxygen, and then also oxygen can cause the release of carbon dioxide, okay? So that's described by this Haldane equation. CO2 binds to hemoglobin, release of oxygen. If I wanna go the other way, oxygen binds to hemoglobin, causes dissociation of CO2. Now one question I have is, particularly the second part right here where I get release of carbon dioxide. Where might this be important? Well, where am I going to get a huge influx of oxygen? When I inspire, when I breathe. So this is going to occur in the lungs. So if I have a huge inspiration of oxygen, so I breathe in and I get a huge rush of oxygen, that's going to cause CO2 to be dumped. 
Why is that important? Because this CO2, oops, this CO2 gets exhaled, right? You've heard all your life CO2 is exhaled, oxygen is inhaled, right? That's why this occurs. You breathe in, the oxygen gets flooded into a huge concentration that causes release of CO2, which gets exhaled, right? And then this part occurs at the tissue level where you have metabolically active cells. They're producing a lot of CO2 as a waste product. The CO2 binds to hemoglobin and it causes release of oxygen to the tissues because they need it, okay? And this is really just a beautiful system that is literally only governed by Le Chatelier's principle, simply a gen chem concept. And that's something that really amazes me, and it really is a beautiful system. And so this is ultimately how it works. So I hope this video made sense. Um, make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos. Um, ultimately, in the next video, we're going to go over 2,3-BPG or 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate, which allosterically regulates hemoglobin, and I hope you join us for that. Thank you very much for watching this video.